So with more than 50 million records in a career that started in the 70s, but first burst onto the music scene uh, and rewrote the rule book for women in rock and roll. She's Susie Quattro, of course. In the heyday of rock and roll, before the Runaways stormed the scene and the Go-Go's ruled the charts, one woman blazed a trail like no other. With her iconic black leather jumpsuit and bass guitar in hand, Susie Quattro set the stage on fire with anthems like Can the Cannon Devilgate Drive, embodying the rebellious spirit of the 1970s. But what happened to this trailblazing rocker once the lights dimmed on happy days? Did she continue to rock the stage with the same fervor, or did she trade her leather jumpsuit for a quieter life away from the spotlight? Join us as we show you what really happened to Susie Quattro of Happy Days. Susie Quattro's Early Musical Journey Amidst the vibrant musical energy of Detroit pulsing through its streets, Susie Quattro, born as Susan K. Quattro on June 3, 1950, was destined for a life intertwined with melody and rhythm. Growing up in a household steeped in musicality, Susie Quattro's family boasted an impressive lineage of talent. Her father, Art Quattro, juggled his role as a jazz musician with a day job at General Motors, indulging his passion for music by night. Meanwhile, her mother, Helen, brought a touch of international flavor from her Hungarian roots. Surrounded by a plethora of instruments at home, Susie and her siblings naturally gravitated towards music from a young age. At the tender age of six, Susie's world was forever changed after witnessing Elvis Presley's electrifying performance on television. The sheer energy and showmanship of the king left an indelible mark on her young mind. Not long after, around the age of seven or eight, depending on the source, Susie took her first steps onto the stage, joining her father's jazz trio and showcasing her burgeoning talent by playing bongos and percussion. This early exposure to live performance not only ignited her passion for music, but also instilled in her a sense of comfort and confidence in front of an audience. Despite her undeniable talent and groundbreaking contributions to rock music, why did Susie Quattro struggle to achieve significant success in her homeland of America compared to her international acclaim? And what pivotal role did Susie's early experiences with the pleasure seekers play in shaping her career trajectory? especially as a female rocker. Keep watching to find out more. Throughout her childhood, Susie's parents also fostered several other children, temporarily exposing her to diversity and new perspectives. Growing up as the fourth of five children in a bustling household filled with music and chaos, Susie Quattro was immersed in a vibrant musical environment from an early age. With three older sisters and a younger brother, including her sibling, Michael Quattro, who also pursued music professionally, Susie had constant access to instruments at home. Her innate talent became evident as she taught herself bass guitar and keyboards. By the age of 11, Susie was already showcasing her skills as a go-go dancer on local Detroit television, set against the backdrop of Motown's iconic sound. Surrounded by the soulful beats of Motown legends like The Supremes, Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, and The Temptations, Susie absorbed these influences shaping her musical style for years to come. Though immersed in American R&B, Susie has cited British invasion bands like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones as major inspirations. Growing up, seeing the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show in February 1964 was a seminal moment for her. The Beatlemania craze that ensued opened Susie's eyes to the tremendous power of rock and roll music. Little did she know then that she would become a pioneer in that male-dominated genre a decade later. Sonic Sisters, the rise of the pleasure seekers in Detroit's rock scene. In 1964, when Susie was just one years old, her older sister Patty started an all-female garage rock band called The Pleasure Seekers with two friends in their neighborhood. This was during the height of the British invasion, spearheaded by the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. Inspired by their idols, Patty saw an opportunity for an all-girl rock group to make waves. One month after forming in June 1964, Susie joined the band on bass guitar and as a lead vocalist, adopting the stage name Susie Soul. Patty went by Patty Pleasure. As the Pleasure Seekers, the Quattro Sisters and their bandmates quickly made a name for themselves around the burgeoning Detroit music scene. The Pleasure Seekers started out playing local gigs and talent shows, 
quickly gaining recognition for their edgy rock sound and confident stage presence as an all-female band. By 1965, they were regular performers at popular Michigan nightclubs. In spring 1966, the group expanded when Susie and Patty's older sister Arlene joined on keyboards with her husband Leo Fenn, managing the business side. Despite facing skepticism and chauvinism, the Quattro sisters persevered, with their local profile growing rapidly. In 1967, they even appeared on Detroit television and opened for major acts like Chuck Berry, although Susie recalls her father confronting Berry for inappropriate behavior backstage. By 1968, they had graduated to touring regionally and even booked some short tours overseas. They embraced the challenges of life on the road, traveling long distances in cramped vans to deliver electrifying performances to their enthusiastic fans. Upon securing a record deal with Mercury Records in 1968, they embarked on a journey of releasing singles and being featured on compilation albums, shining a spotlight on the vibrant Detroit music scene. Their commitment to their craft was unwavering, whether performing in cabarets or recording in the studio. The band underwent changes and growth over the years, including a name change to Cradle in 1969 and fluctuations in personnel. Despite the ups and downs, Susie remained at the helm as the band's anchor and frontwoman for nearly seven years, from ages 14 to 21. Susie Quattro's Big Move to Britain In 1971, Susie Quattro decided it was time to venture out on her own. After feeling the need for a change both musically and personally, Susie Quattro decided to step away from her sister's band and explore new horizons beyond Detroit. As fate would have it, a remarkable opportunity emerged in 1971 when English record producer Mickey Most, the owner of Rack Records, caught wind of Susie's electrifying performance with her band, Cradle. Impressed by Susie's commanding presence as a frontwoman and her skills on the bass guitar, Most was determined to nurture her star potential. Encouraged by Susie's brother Michael, Most agreed to witness her talent firsthand during Cradle's British tour that summer. Completely won over by Susie's performance, Most wasted no time in persuading her to sign with Rack Records and embark on a solo career in London. For Susie, this meant leaving behind her family and the familiar streets of Detroit, but the allure of this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity was too strong to resist. In October 1971, Susie took the leap of faith and made the life-changing move across the pond to pursue her dreams of international stardom. She immersed herself in London's thriving music scene. Susie Quattro was introduced to songwriter Peter William Hamm, known for his hit compositions for British pop star Cliff Richard. With Hamm's guidance, Susie auditioned and formed a talented backing band from skilled British musicians, elevating her profile. This led to her touring the UK as the opening act for rock band Thin Lizzy in 1972 solidifying her presence in the music scene. This gave her valuable exposure in front of large crowds. Though initial singles failed to gain traction in most countries, 1972's Rolling Stone became an unexpected hit in Portugal, shooting to number one on the charts there. This early success in Portugal gave Susie's career some initial momentum. Rocking across continents, Susie Quattro's meteoric rise from can the can to global domination the year 1973 marked Susie Quattro's major breakthrough as a solo star, thanks to her smash hit Can the Can. When Susie first listened to the song written by British hitmakers Mike Chapman and Nicky Chin, she immediately sensed its potential for greatness. The combination of nonsensical lyrics, gritty guitar riffs, and intense percussion resonated perfectly with the bold rock style she aimed to embody. Upon its release as a single in May 1973, Can the Con quickly skyrocketed to the top of the UK charts by July, also claiming the number one spot in countries like Australia, Spain, and South Africa. Back home in America, it managed to climb to a modest number 56, but the song's worldwide success solidified Susie as an unstoppable force in music. The accompanying album Susie Quattro also performed well, making it to number 32. Empowered by her previous success, Susie swiftly capitalized on her momentum by collaborating once again with Chapman and Chin to deliver more hit singles. Among them was Devilgate Drive, a chart-topping sensation in the UK. 
Susie's iconic performance of the song on top of the pops, clad in her trademark black leather jumpsuit and wielding her bass guitar, remains etched in memory. The year 1974 also saw the release of her second LP, Quattro, which contains songs like Daytona Demon and her first UK top 10 track, 48 Crash. During Susie's prime years, touring emerged as a crucial element in her career. In late 1973, she joined glam rocker Slade on their UK tour, seizing the opportunity to captivate large audiences with her electrifying rock performances. This collaboration proved mutually beneficial, as Susie gained exposure while utilizing Slade's cutting-edge PA system at no cost. Her international triumphs continued in 1974 with a tour across Japan, where she made history as the first female rock singer to headline concerts in major Japanese cities. Susie's popularity soared across continents, setting the stage for her next triumph in Australia in 1976. There, she performed to packed venues, solidifying her status as a rock star in the land down under. Through extensive touring from 1973 to 1976, Susie Quattro had grown from a Detroit novice to an unstoppable global phenomenon beyond the musical hits. Susie Quattro's diverse career journey from a rock star to TV star. By the late 1970s, Susie Quattro sought new creative challenges outside her extraordinary music career. Susie's foray into television acting began with her portrayal of Leather Tuscadero on the beloved sitcom Happy Days. Remarkably, she landed the role without an audition, thanks to producer Gary Marshall spotting her photo in his daughter's room. As Leather, Susie brought a cool, leather-clad rocker vibe to the show, playing the younger sister of Fonzie's past flame, Pinky Tuscadero. Her performance left such an impression that Marshall even considered a spin-off series centered around Leather Tuscadero, but Susie opted to stay true to her musical roots. Her appearances on Happy Days not only showcased her acting talent, but also introduced her to American audiences on a weekly basis, helping to raise her profile in the notoriously tough U.S. market. In 1979, Susie ventured further into acting by starring in a BBC TV play titled Pleasure Cove. In this production, she portrayed a singer whose glamorous pop career takes a downturn, leading her to return home. Notably, Susie's own music was prominently featured on the show's soundtrack, further intertwining her acting and musical endeavors. On stage, Susie pursued lead roles in musicals like a 1986 West End production of Annie Get Your Gun, portraying the spunky Annie Oakley. Her spirited acting and stellar singing voice were lauded despite being a bold choice for the role. She returned to the stage in 1991, this time devising her own one-woman show about 1920s icon Tallulah Bankhead, titled Tallulah Who, which ran for a month in England. Regarding her musical evolution, Susie began incorporating more pop, new wave, and adult contemporary influences into her work in the late 70s and 80s. 1978 brought one of her biggest U.S. hits via a duet with Smokey Chris Norman called Stumblin' In. The softer sound marked a maturity in her approach. Parental-themed tunes like 1981's Mama's Boy also showcased versatility. Experimentation flowed through albums like 1979's Susie and other four-letter words, which contained the synth-heavy She's In Love With You. Disco funk permeated her sound on tracks like 1982's Tonight I Could Fall In Love. Throughout the era, Susie proved she could transcend her rock roots without sacrificing integrity. However, this sonic shape-shifting did not always translate to maintaining chart success, but Susie followed her artistic muse rather than chasing fleeting commercial rewards. Susie Quattro's iconic legacy and gender-defying impact on rock music Aside from catchy songs, Susie Quattro's groundbreaking musical legacy stems from her subversion of female stereotypes in rock. Through a bold style and masterful bass guitar skills, she rejected stifling femininity and expectations to present a strong, empowered, leather-clad rock goddess image paired with tough bass lines. When Susie was first promoting her 1973 smash Can the Can, she insisted on wearing her signature black leather jumpsuit look for photo shoots. This drew pushback from her record label, who thought she should have a softer, more pop star image. 
But Susie would not compromise her rocker authenticity and won out, establishing her now iconic leather-centric aesthetic. In many ways, Susie's choice of clothing channeled female strength and echoed her hero, Elvis Presley's leather outfits. She has also cited the sci-fi film Barbarella as an inspiration for her daring stage fashion. Along with the leather jumpsuits, Susie often sported a shag mullet hairstyle and dark eye makeup on stage and album covers. This created a look that screamed rebellion and rejected conventional standards of so-called appropriate femininity. Susie's status as a fierce frontwoman playing bass also broke ground. She has been deemed the first female bass guitarist to achieve international fame in the male-dominated world of rock music. As a bass player and vocalist, her bass chops were evident on funky lines in songs like Can the Can and held down rhythms tightly in concert with her bands. She could effortlessly switch between playing intricate parts and belting out vocals, a unique double-duty skill set in the male-dominated realm of rock. Susie's domineering stage presence and bass-playing abilities sent a bold message. Her success proved women could rock just as hard as men. She inspired legions of girls so that they too could pick up a bass and rock out without conforming to stifling gender roles. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame recognized Sue's pioneering impact when they featured her iconic jumpsuit and bass in a 2018 exhibit about rock fashion. Her influence extends to many prominent female musicians who cite seeing Sue's command of the stage as motivation. Artists like The Runaways, Joan Jett, and Talking Heads' Tina Weymouth specifically credit her as a role model. Susie Quattro's groundbreaking style and musical skills didn't just break the mold, they shattered it. She made the male-centric rock genre more inclusive and welcoming to female performers by blazing her own trail on her own terms. That leather-clad legacy still resonates today. The Personal Turmoil and Triumphs of Suzy Quattro Though Suzy Quattro faced immense professional success starting in 1973, her personal life behind the scenes experienced its share of love struggles and losses. In 1976, Suzy tied the knot with her guitarist, Len Tucky, marking the beginning of a union that spanned over 15 years. Their relationship blossomed amidst their collaborative musical endeavors, with Len contributing his talents to hits like Can the Can. The couple built a life together, purchasing a picturesque manor home in Essex, England, where they raised their two children, Laura and Richard Leonard. Suzy temporarily stepped away from her music career to focus on motherhood, cherishing the joy of being a stay-at-home mom. However, beneath the surface, tensions began to simmer as Susie and Len found themselves pulled in different directions by their professional and personal aspirations. While Susie prioritized her family, Len's passion for music urged him to continue pursuing his musical endeavors. By the late 80s, Susie felt the call of the stage once again, reigniting her passion for rock music. Yet this resurgence in her career only exacerbated the strain on her marriage as Len yearned for more time together at home. Despite their efforts to reconcile through counseling, the growing divide between their musical and family commitments ultimately led to their decision to part ways amicably in 1992. Despite the end of their romantic relationship, Susie and Len remained committed to co-parenting their children with civility and respect. The next year, Susie married German concert promoter Rainer Haas, whom she had first met backstage at a 1986 show. Haas lived in Hamburg, Germany, while Susie resided primarily in England, so they often had a long-distance relationship. Susie's divorce and remarriage coincided with her fading record sales and fame. The 90s brought a halt to her professional success and shifted her focus toward live performances overseas, where she retained more popularity. Through ups and downs, her passion for music endured. The divorce took a toll on Susie's son, Richard, who was only eight years old at the time. He became rebellious during his teenage years, troubled by his parents splitting up. This caused Susie much stress as a mom. Thankfully, after some difficult years, Richard matured and he and Susie rebuilt their relationship. Susie lamented not getting as much time with her kids once her stardom took off. She tried balancing career and family, but felt she came up short at times in both, a common struggle for famous musicians. Still, she did her best despite inevitable mistakes. By 2006, Susie's daughter Laura and young granddaughter returned to live with her in the Essex Manor home, a happy development. 
However, Susie revealed she battled empty nest loneliness when they eventually moved out again a couple of years later. As the children grew more independent, Susie Quattro experienced the peaks of fame and depths of personal challenges throughout her life's journey. Though not immune to struggles, her dedication to music and family always persevered. Susie Quattro's never-ending tours. While Susie Quattro's hit-making heyday faded by the late 1980s, her popularity and relentless touring schedule continued strongly overseas. This was especially true in Europe, Australia, and Japan, where she retained a devoted fan following. After rising to fame in England in 1973, the UK remained a consistent stronghold, even as the 1990s brought a drought in chart success. Britain truly adopted Susie as one of their own. She had hosted popular BBC radio programs centered on rock music during the late 80s. Throughout her career, Susie routinely toured across Europe, playing festivals and headlining shows from Germany to Spain. In 2010, she performed at massive British festivals like the Isle of Wight alongside acts like Paul McCartney. Her music resonated across generations. Japan also stayed loyal from her earliest concerts there in 1974 onward. Susie enjoyed a special bond with Japanese fans and returned frequently over the decades for concerts. She was humbled by their steadfast devotion. Australia grew into perhaps Susie's strongest territory besides the UK. Her popularity there exploded in 1976 when she undertook a wildly successful Australia-wide tour that cemented her status. Through the 90s, she continued selling out arenas down under. Touring the world enabled Susie to stay actively doing what she loved most, performing live rock and roll. The crowds and energy kept her feeling youthful and engaged. While not having hit albums, the shows provided creative fulfillment and connection with fans. The touring also afforded Susie financial stability when record sales declined. She was a music industry workhorse, crisscrossing continents annually, far into her 60s and 70s when others would have retired. This tireless schedule garnered immense respect. Mystery behind Susie Quattro's elusive American fame. One perplexing aspect of Susie Quattro's career is that she never achieved proportionate success or acclaim in her homeland of America compared to abroad. Various factors contributed to this enigmatic US factor. Born in Detroit as rock music exploded, Susie seemed destined for stateside fame. But after local growth with her sister's band, The Pleasure Seekers, she left for England where she had great success. However, American audiences remained elusive. Despite being the world's largest music market, early hits like Can the Can made little commercial impact on US charts. Critics also misunderstood or derided her edgy image and bubbly glam rock tunes as manufactured. Susie did gain some visibility by playing Leather Tuscadero on Happy Days, but she declined offers for a spin-off, keeping music first. Sporadic US radio airplay for later singles like Stumbling In arose, but mainstream fame never materialized at home. Geography and timing likely hindered Susie's chances in America. If she had stayed stateside a bit longer before relocating overseas, perhaps she may have built enough grassroots buzz to launch with US labels and promoters fully behind her. Plus, Susie's glam rock heyday of the early 70s somewhat missed the crest of America's rock wave. She was sandwiched between the psychedelic 60s and punk disco 70s. While Britain embraced glam rock openly, different cultural tastes hampered connectivity. That said, Susie amassed a devoted American fan base over the years through touring and retained strong Detroit roots. She just never converted that into mass visibility. Susie Quattro's comeback trail from the 1990s to the 2000s. In her later career, after her commercial peak in the 1970s, Susie Quattro's music career quieted down for a while until she regained momentum with a roaring comeback in the 1990s and 2000s. This era brought belated recognition for her pioneering early career and trailblazing female rocker status. The early 90s saw Susie return to releasing new studio albums after a recording hiatus in the late 80s. She aimed to re-establish herself as a viable artist, exploring mature themes. 
Efforts included the well-received 1992 album Oh Suzy Q and 1993's What Goes Around, demonstrating longevity. In 1998, unreleased Emotion compiled unheard songs from earlier in her career alongside new tracks, proving herself an enduring talent, not just a 70s novelty. Energized by playing her first U.S. show in years in 1991, Susie kept writing and recording. 2006's album, Back to the Drive-In, marked a full-fledged comeback, hitting number one on Amazon's rock charts, her first chart topper in decades. Mainstream recognition followed with BBC R2 naming Susie Quattro one of the queens of British pop and producing a 2007 documentary profiling her groundbreaking career. This honored her alongside fellow pioneers like Dusty Springfield. That same year, Susie published her autobiography, Unzipped, taking fans through her rock and roll journey. She also received the honor of being depicted on a postage stamp in the Isle of Man. In 2010, Susie was inducted into the Michigan Rock and Roll Legends Hall of Fame, voted by fans. The hometown recognition in Detroit held deep meaning, as did being awarded for musical excellence in Hungary her mother's homeland. The enduring legacy of Susie Quattro, the godmother of rock. For defiantly breaking ground as a leather-clad female bass-playing rocker in the 1970s, Susie Quattro earned the moniker, the godmother of rock. Susie Quattro's impact on female musicians and her role in breaking down barriers for women in rock music cannot be overstated. With her exceptional bass skills, powerful stage presence, and daring fashion sense, she shattered stereotypes and opened doors for women to be recognized not just as vocalists, but as instrumentalists and leaders of their own bands. Her influence reverberates across generations and genres, inspiring major female artists like Joan Jett, Debbie Harry, Chrissy Hine, Tina Weymouth, KT Tunstall, and Kathleen Hanna of Bikini Kill. By showcasing women rocking out, Susie played a pivotal role in sparking the female punk wave revolution of the late 70s and beyond. But Susie's impact goes beyond the realm of professional musicians. She became a beacon of empowerment for ordinary women and girls, encouraging them to pursue their musical passions without fear of judgment. Through anthems like Can the Can and Devilgate Drive, she instilled confidence and a sense of inner strength in her fans, empowering them to embrace their true selves. In essence, Suzy Quattro's legacy is one of empowerment and liberation, inspiring countless individuals to defy expectations and pursue their dreams, regardless of gender or societal norms. Suzy's tough bass playing showed that women could hang with male musicians instrumentally. Suzy Quattro's perseverance in breaking into male-dominated territory not only propelled her own career, but also paved the way for leading ladies in rock, such as Debbie Harry, Stevie Nicks, Pat Benatar, and the Go-Go's in the 80s. Beyond rock, her bold stage costumes inspired female pop icons like Madonna to take control of their image. Despite preceding major women's liberation movements, Susie's impact as a strong female role model in music was monumental, earning her the title Godmother of Rock. She led by example, letting her bass guitar speak volumes. Despite facing industry sexism in the 70s, Susie remained resilient and relevant through cultural shifts. Even at 70 years old, she swiftly recovered from COVID-19 in late 2020, showcasing her tenacity. Rooted in her working-class Detroit upbringing, Susie upholds a strong work ethic, always focused on the next album, show, and opportunity. Reflecting on her career, she takes pride in doing things on her own terms, prioritizing artistry over chart positions. Her unwavering self-determination continues to fuel her passion for music, inspiring audiences worldwide. She rocks for the sheer love of rock at an age when most consider retirement. It is this enduring passion for her craft that drives Susie Quattro to just keep going, blazing her pioneering path wherever it takes her. That tenacity cements her icon status. Susie Quattro felt like her sister erased her from their family. Rocker Suzy Quattro says she felt like her sister erased her from their family. As previously stated, the Wild One singer, 72, was in an all-female group called the Pleasure Seekers with her sibling Patty, 74, but left to pursue her solo career in Britain and said she was devastated when she finally returned to her Detroit homeland and found her sister had taken clothes she left in her old bedroom to make herself outfits. She told the Mail on Sunday, December 12, 2023, 
that here is a difference between truth and perception, and that it's a big subject for her. The Wild Singer also claimed that over the years, she's had many things happen and situations occur, and she knew the truth of how she experienced them. But she's also aware everyone perceives them differently. Susie also brought people's minds to her 2007 autobiography, Unzip, which mentioned earlier of how she was a teenager in Detroit, and her older sister Patty, including her, were in an all-female rock band, The Pleasure Seekers. Susie claimed that she got picked out for a UK-based solo career and Patty joined another American girl group, Fanny, but didn't make it big like she wanted to. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe to our channel and check out another of our interesting videos before you leave.